from here I stop sharing my screen and give it to Tobias. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for, for having me today. Um, so I go, well, this is only the abstract, okay? The other slides will all have a little bit less content. So um, my name is Tobias Weinziel. I'm working at Durham University, um, where I do my, my, I think my main job at the moment is I'm the director of the Master in Scientific Computing and Data Analysis, um, but I'm also uh, working there as a normal academic. Um, and this is really kind of a biopic, okay? Um, this is a not, usually I speak quite a lot about algorithms because I'm uh, on, on the on the continuous spectrum of scientific computing, very much on the theory side, I guess, um, on the computer science theory side. But but this is not a this is not a talk about the algorithms. This is primarily a talk about our software that we use, our workhorse, uh, and some experiences we've I've made over over the years. And so it's all totally biased, and and, and very likely a lot of it is wrong. So. Um, yeah, Piano is, I'm not gonna, I, I'm gonna speak about Piano, but but actually the project that drives it for, for now for seven, eight years is called ExaHype. Um, that means an exascale uh, hyperbolic PDE engine. And I hope you you hear the sarcasm in the acronym, okay? So our, our, our vision had been right from the start that we want to allow groups with a certain computational background, but not necessarily an HPC background. To, to write exascale solvers for these type of equations. Okay, so that's the standard way to write down first order hyperbolic uh, partial differential equations. Um, and and th that was our goal. So we wanted to write an engine that allows groups to do that. And in the original exahype project, I will come back to that later on. Um, we had two different user communities involved in, in that consortium and one group that still use the software quite a lot is um, uh, seismic simulations, okay, where you simulate how earthquakes evolve. You've, you've seen that, and I also posted in the in the chat, I posted some links on that, so you can watch videos from there, or you can watch them from our YouTube channel. Uh, and the other community that, or the other group that, that used it is uh, in astrophysics, where we are interested in gravitational waves. And that, that research has very much moved to, to Durham now. Okay, so, um, this is a blunt vision. This is a very ambitious vision, and um, we, you have to t you have visions if you leave the pub, isn't it? So you have to tell people how you get there. That's the, that's the art, um, and um, we wanted to achieve that by writing an engine where users decide what to solve, and the engine then decides how to solve it in a certain way, and it decides where and when. So it does the scheduling. So it's an engine. So what does that mean? Computer scientists are well familiar with the term framework. That's something we write every day, okay? When we solve a problem, we usually don't solve the problem. We write a new framework. So what, what we do here is we want to write an engine. And I can tell you what that means with a metaphor. Um, if I show you those plots, you immediately can tell me something. So we see here left, that's from papers that, that I've written. And you might immediately say, well, that's clear. He used matplotlib. In the center column, that's data. Uh, my, my postdoc Holger sent me, who is in that call today. And you see he's a fan of R, though my, my PDF here doesn't show the dots. So it's, um, but, but people immediately say, well, that's R. And then the right thing, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's LibreOffice. OK, so it's Microsoft. So when you see a plot, you immediately know what kind of style is behind that plot, what kind of algorithms, what kind of visual language drives this plot. And we want to take this, we want to do something similar for large scale computations for earthquakes and for gravitational waves. And that's where the name engine stems from. So the idea is, um, it's not about visuals here, okay? It's basically, if you use our software, then you buy into a certain numerical class. So we use A to D G plus finite volumes. You buy into space trees with three partitioning. I'll come back to that later on. And in the original proposal, you also did buy into interspecific kernels, okay? I'll also come back in to, to that one later on. Okay, so um, that's uh, I, I probably, that was what we ended up. So the idea is you write a Python spec file at the end, okay? Where you say what kind of order you want, what kind of solver flavor you want to run a generator. Then you implement some physics because it's still the users that say what they do. And then you type in make and then everything works. Um, and you feel free to try it out. I can give you the links, all the stuff is all open source, but that's not what this talk is about, 
Okay. The, this talk, I want to kind of review how did we get there? Uh, and does that an idea with the engine work out and, and, and what happened to all the software under the hood over the years? Okay, so no more fancy pictures of earthquakes or whatever. So this all started pre-2005 when I worked as a student research assistant um, in, in Munich at TUM. And at that time, people always already told you, oh, memory accesses, that will be the, the performance critical thing. So we have to get that right. Because at that time, we already saw this widening compute memory gap. So computers just become exponentially faster and the, the memory bandwidth just can't keep pace. And also the data movements cause the energy requirements. You still find that in the exascale um, roadmaps. And it was very clear, cache is right to rescue us. Um, and cache optimization is all well known. You can do basically blocking, okay, running in certain, using data over and over again, and you can do that spatially or temporally. Um, but all of that is very, very difficult if you have changing irregular data. So that was what where we had been 2005. And then there was this idea in Munich at the time that was very much driven by Christoph Zenger, who is long uh, then retired or is long retired since then. And what he did is he assembled three PhD students and I think more than nine MSc thesis um, and had a very classic idea, nothing fancy there. So he basically said, let's use the octree idea. So, so here on the left, you see an octree. We know that from computer graphics and octrees are great because octrees uh, support AMR. Okay, you add a few more elements to the tree and you, you're fine or you remove stuff. They spawn multi-scale meshes. You have multiple resolutions. That's very fancy for some linear algebra and they have tensor product style. Okay, so the faces are orthogonal to each other. That makes the math sometimes easier. That was all well known, but then his new idea, and that was really absolutely, I think that's a really cool idea, is he said, we can linearize those trees along space filling curves and then store all data on stacks. And um, for those of you who have worked with, with cache oblivious algorithms, stacks are intrinsically cache oblivious if you have a finite number. So you get brilliant cache hit rates. Um, there's a, the original paper down is here. There's a better one in CISC if you want to understand the algorithms. Okay, that worked. That was the first generation of Piano, achievement number one, multiple MSc thesis, all three PhD uh, graduated. So they wrote the code in 2D, 3D, and with some activity criteria. Uh, and it also made one postdoc finisher habilitation. So great stuff. Uh, we got lots of publications out of that. Well, actually not me, but the, the group, I was a student assistant at the time. There were two DFG, that's the German EPSRC uh, follow-up projects. I'll come back to those later on. Uh, and those basically uh, allowed the, the JAIR at the time to offer, or the group to offer 2.5 PhD positions. So that's all great. There's another uh, achievement there, which is probably not that great. And that is, um, we ended up with, um, I would say 10 to 12 different code bases and everybody could do something different than the other one, but they were not compatible. Okay, so it was rather a code family than than one code. Okay, uh, stage open for piano second try. Okay, one to rule them all. So we had those two, the, oh, there were these two big projects. As I said, I didn't acquire them, but I was hired then as a PhD student at one of them. Uh, and this was basically do some standard computational fluid dynamics. Um, you see one picture there that was a microfluid, and then there was something called the EFG benchmark. Um, and both of them need AMR and, and do some other stuff. So the idea was basically to use our code, our idea how to organize data structures to write uh, codes that solve fluid dynamic problems. The problem was all the MSc students had left. That's what MSc students do by, by construction. None of the PhDs pursued an academic career where one at least stayed with MathWorks, the other two went into the automotive industry. And we found that the forks are totally incompatible. Okay, so there was no way to fuse them. They have, they have basically diverged from each other. So the way out is very clear. What the then project coordinator did, she said, well, um, let's just offer a PhD, which is kind of open-ended. And the message is just combine those features and then we look what you really do at, as research. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a, an engineering thing. Okay, just bring the stuff together first and then we see where we can, this is an enabling thing. And it became clear that this is not possible. So we rewrote everything from scratch. That's fine because computer scientists like to, to rewrite everything from scratch anyway. Uh, and let's try not to make the same errors again. 
So what's the problem or what has been the problem? We work in computational science and engineering. That means we bring together applications, computer science and applied math. And that's nice, okay, it's interdisciplinary. Unfortunately, our codes are now interdisciplinary as well, okay? They mangle everything up, data organization, movements, mathematical schemes, physical models, you name it, okay? It's, it's one big code mess and someone who's very close to me always says, well, are you working on your monster, okay? Probably phrases that. I can illustrate what I mean with that simple OMP statement, okay? Where we have a for loop, which basically incorporates how we run through data. There's a pragma OMP parallel on top, which says how we could schedule things. And then there is the actual uh, knowledge inside the loop body. That's a very simple example of what I mean. Three different things intermixed. Um, okay. The other thing why it's challenging code is dense, okay? There is a single switch in a numerical code can kill you on the long term. Code is floating point heavy, makes it difficult to test. It runs on a parallel computer. It's non-deterministic, also not that easy to test. Um, and the, the code is tricky, okay? The, the core description of the algorithms has 40 plus pages. And unfortunately at the time, the key graduate who had written those core uh, had left. So she got a pretty well-paid job somewhere in industry was not there. So it took me around two years to digest the algorithm. I simplified it quite dramatically, but it took me two years to understand it and to bring up the core algorithm and the infrastructure. Okay, so and the, the, the fundamental idea how we got things right because we wanted to do things better was to introduce the Hollywood principle. And that's a fancy slogan for the Gamma Helm, Johnson Felicitas thing for to, to, com to combine a composite pattern plus a visitor pattern plus a parallel tree traversal. So the idea is rather than forcing the user to write for loops and do stuff, okay? We do all of that. And then we call back the user and say, oh, now we have a cell, what shall we do? And, and now we have, a, we have a phase, what shall we do? And so forth and so forth. So that's the, the, the Hollywood principle. We call the user. So the user has no control anymore how we run through these data structures, how we schedule things and so forth and so forth. Okay. Lesson learned, second generation of piano. We delivered upon the projects, more or less. Okay, that's always an, uh, a gray area, but I think we did it. Uh, I graduated, that's great. Uh, a colleague of mine who helped me to write it graduated as well, that's even better. Um, we got some key papers that, that formalize the, the core concepts that will be important later on. It was a game changer, um, but we also had issues. And the most important thing is this re-education re didn't go down well. So we basically told our users, just tell us what you want to do whenever you are in a mesh in this element or whenever you get that data. But that was not how our colleagues had been educated. They always told me, well, I want to solve this equation system and we typically do it that way. Well, that's not what you want. You want to know from your user base what they want to solve, not how, and that didn't work. So people started to, we're, we're not used to that, that they have to digest, they have to extract how to do things and really describe it formally and not tell us how to do things, but you know, it's a different way to think. Um, they also started to work around the concept of, of this idea of, of the callback and the code quality wasn't that great either because it was again, all a little bit intermixed. So it's an exile. Number three, I, after I graduated, I continued as a postdoc at TUM, it was 2010. And then later on, I, uh, I changed to Durham. And um, at that time, it was uh, suddenly many cores everywhere. That was the KNL age. Okay. We thought, well, core nodes will have 40, 50, 60 cores per, per node. That's it. Um, and what we found when we looked at our code, mm, ah, we have to rewrite it. Unfortunately, we tried to do that visitor pattern. That means with every new requirements, our interfaces became bigger and bigger and bigger. So they were really blown up. Uh, and we had tons of fancy C++ code. Today, I would call that pat pattern pollution, okay? Here is an adapter. Oh, and here's by the way, a new singleton. And we need that one, uh, that visitor here. And it was all kind of a mess. Okay, so we decided let's rewrite. Well, I decided let's, let's rewrite the key algorithms because at that time, hmm, my colleague had graduated, I had graduated and the MSc pro, uh, students that helped us with the code had graduated as well. So, okay, let's rewrite the key algorithms. And then when Exahype came around the corner that was Horizon 2020 funded, 
uh, and driven by, by a colleague of mine from Munich, Michael Bader, we said, well, let's just apply the same idea once again, this idea with the Hollywood principle. So users can really come focus on their equations uh, and let's heavily rely on code generation. And code generation here, I mean, let's not do all that fancy object-oriented stuff, but let's introduce some code generation that was originally written in Java that creates all the glue code, so free to use it. So the rewrite did work out brilliantly because this time we had something different. This time, you're using the old software didn't work as all the signature changed, everything changed. But now we were in a situation where we had formalized description and pseudocode that were well documented. So this is from another paper, okay, on, on particles, but there is a CISC paper on the on, on piano, which exactly describes how the core algorithms work. And, and actually that was then pretty straightforward to move it over, but it was not code reuse, it was algorithm reuse. So that was, was big pro. Um, so that worked down well. The code generation didn't work down that well because what happened is, um, we created all the clue code and people didn't like it. And, and we will see why that, why that is. Okay, so lessons learned, that, that's basically it. Users don't like signature changes. Ah, what a surprise because they have to touch everything. But users don't like a code generator that overrides their manual fixes either. So people, when you give them code generators, they alter stuff, rerun the code generator, doesn't work. Also, users don't usually like to dig into some fancy, as I said, that's Java code and, and uh, automaton based parsing, and they didn't like that either. So, so that was a little bit of a problem. So people weren't very happy with the code generation approach. Um, if they fix it, they usually fix it the wrong way. Okay, so they try to make a screw here, but it's not fixing the code generator. It's usually fixing the code generator for one particular application, which is exactly a contradiction to what we wanted to do. Uh, we also found that users still don't like to be re-educated because that's exactly what happened. Okay, they say, well, we always do it that way. So let's fix the code generator. Um, and we also found people not more fewer and fewer of our collaborators know C++. Okay, in particular in the math community, it's that we worked with. Fortran is predominant, and a lot of students don't learn C++ anymore. A lot of them are very Python focused nowadays. Uh, by the way, also students don't. Uh, sorry, users don't like to learn new languages. Okay, why should they learn a special purpose code generation language? So that that whole domain specific language thing didn't really fly. Okay, so what happened after uh, Exahype? I think Exahype was a success. Okay, we got some really cool stuff out there, which is top notch. Um, a little bit later, um, Excalibur in the UK came around the corner. And what we now try to do is we try to connect our Exahype idea or our piano to third party lips. So the established um, Riemann solvers in the world. We try to port stuff to GPUs because the many core area of claim is gone, okay? With Intel discontinuing KNLs, it's now GPUs everywhere. And we have to improve all aspects of scalability. Problem again, the key developer behind Exahype has left. He joined AMD. Uh, and as I said, exascale paradigms have changed. So quite a lot of the stuff we did for KNLs probably do not apply one-to-one -one for GP GPUs. So that's an annoying situation we found ourselves in, but it's also deja vu. So what we had to do, we had to rewrite the key algorithms once more and translate them into an accelerator area. Uh, we had to rewrite the code generators. This time we decided to, let's do that in Python and then have problem specific callbacks. So no overblown up into generic interfaces. Let's, let's bring them down. Uh, and we decided, well, this time we do something different. We decide every key decision formally. Okay, because Tom's is around transactional mathematical software and Cisc has a software track. And did it work? Well, I'll leave that to you. Um, that's something uh, everybody has to decide for themselves. Um, I think in, in, in some ways it's a really cool software now and, and we're making progress. Um, whether it works or not, in my opinion, is a little bit irrelevant to this talk. Let's, let's look at the software side again, because usually we, we measure success in, in, in terms of papers and, and follow-up grounds, isn't it? So what did, did I learn? So now this is a biased, uh, a biased slide, okay? And, and, and don't get angry if, 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 if I annoy you. Uh, 
it's a little bit of there's some some disc there. Before I do that, uh, why is it called piano? By the way, because we use a space filling curve. Okay, I think I haven't used, I haven't said that. Um, and nowadays, as I said, I think it's it's out there. It's it's a really cool stuff uh, thing. It has now a little bit of a Python esque computing feel. So you have Jupyter notebooks where you where you basically can specify what you do, not how you do stuff. But under the hood, it's C++ and top-notch algorithms. And I'm, I'm proud to say it's top-notch algorithms because what we also know is we can't compute with the national labs or things like that in terms of maturity and diversity, what they cover. So we do very specific things, but we want to have the cooler algorithms for those. That, that's our goal. Okay, so what did I learn? What, what did I have to learn? What, what is maybe to be discussed? And not everything I write down here as a fact and phrase that way is something I really would uh, sign off 100%. But, but there is some, some things to, to think about. So I think the classic software engineering in throughout that development, these four or five brief, well, four rewrites uh, was of limited help, okay? Pair programming, documentation with pros, code refuse, that's all nice and important, but we simply lack the manpower. That's something national labs can do. We can't do because we don't have the people uh, and we don't have the right qualification. You, you don't know all these domains usually, in particular, not if you start a PhD. Oh, let's also be fair, for most PIs, enabling features have a higher priority than code quality. My second takeaway, don't branch, okay? Because our colleagues leave, we all per work towards paper deadlines, so we prefer quick and dirty fixes. Um, and um, people don't reintegrate stuff, and it also leads to that thing, oh, let's just fix the code generator here, and then it will do what we need. So. Um, I think that's a biased interpretation of HR methods and sprints that we have in, in academia, but, but it is that way. We branch and then we diverge. Um, I'm, I'm st I, I started this job and I was very enthusiastic about the paper, uh, about the book from Gamaham Johnson and Felicitas. Nowadays, I'm not a big fan of, of design patterns anymore, or not that much, okay? I think we have very often when people start to introduce them because they like the patterns, we often end up with some kind of pattern pollution and interface over specification because that's tied to the idea of, of object-oriented programming that interfaces have to cover all different cases that we think about. So um, I now personally think it is more important that we document patterns explicitly in papers. Um, I think that, and probably work with, with, with code generators. That, that's in, at the moment the way I would do that. Fourth takeaway take from five, what I think is, Formalization helps a lot. In my opinion, this code reuse doesn't happen that much, and it's also not that useful. People don't reuse code, at least very few of them do. If in doubt, a paper that writes down the algorithm explicitly and allows others to reprogram it is of more use. And the formalization of what algorithms and algorithm code steps need, what constraints they work with, with what data structures, what assertions they have, that helps way more, that formalized thing, because that allows people to use it. Um, that, that's one thing. And the last thing that really doesn't work yet and that I'm still working towards is re-educate your user base, okay? People tell you how to implement stuff, but I think there are more people that are more qualified than the standard software user community to decide how to do things. They should say what and not how. And I think, yeah, no, I don't think, I know that this is my last slide. That's kind of the, 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 the journey behind Exile. Thank you very much for, for listening to my ideas. Thank you, Tobias. So for this great talk, so um, if you have questions, you can unmute yourself, but you can also type in the chat if you would like to do that. Um, so just, um, yeah, raise your hand. I'd look for hands. Here we go. And the Jajindra, I hope I say it right. So you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I mean, uh, that hand was basically to appreciate the talk. Uh, so I don't have any particular question. Sorry if that was uh, misleading. <laughs> thanks a lot. You your hand that you wanted to say something. So, so no, sorry I, for that. No problem. No problem. Um, so I would have a question and um, a little bit 
because I'm a fan of reusing parts of software at least. And I understand that you know, your experience is different there. And I, I like the idea of formalism and really to say, okay, this is the theory that's behind there. So what would you see as a visible step for your software also to say to, to keep some of the software for reuse? Let's say if you have the formalism, you have all the documentation that people can really trust it. Is it maybe testing or offering different data structures? What would be something where you see that reuse could be possible of your software? So what I, what I really would like to have is a better way to phrase, um, to phrase assumptions. So what, you know what really worked out nicely is that idea of how to do Java doc. And I think uh, this is something that the object constraint language did promise, but I think never really delivered is more along these lines where I can formalize my expectations for routines, for whole classes. This is the type of data I need to, to get. This is what I will give you. I think this, this helps a lot. Um, documentation spread over papers, spread over whatever read the docs or whatever is of, of very limited use um it's just my my observation that people rewrite stuff over and over again so we do something wrong there um the other thing that i miss very often is explicit documentation of how software is structured and what the, the guideline the leading ideas behind had been so uh, I, i'm just now involved in 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 two other bigger projects where I just would like to have, give me that 10 pages that really describe how you've built up your software. What were the, the big ideas here? And, and this is stuff that that's urgently missing. Um, yeah, I, I fully agree. So we, we had a workshop like a year, two years ago now, gosh, 2020 is gone. <laughs> um, where we discussed that we need something like a theory software translation because that is what leads us steadily to rewriting software. So thank you very much again for your, for your talk and 